everyone, and welcome to the annual meeting of the Historic Mapping Congress. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm one of the education specialists here at the Charlotte Museum of History, and we are delighted to be hosting this program today uh, for the Historic Mapping Congress, a wonderful partner in all of the history that we do here at the museum. I uh, just want to take a brief moment to give you a quick overview of how today is going to work. We are going to have three different programs. The first program that you're in currently is a uh, lecture series called Hear the Historians, uh, where you'll get a chance to learn a little bit more about some of the research that's being done by local historians here into historic mapping. Uh, the next session is going to be the Business of the Congress. That will be at 1215 and the last session of the day is at one o'clock where you'll get a chance to explore the map that the mapping congress has been working on for the last couple of years uh, if you would like to join any of those programs all you need to do is follow the link that we're going to put down into the chat you should have also received an email earlier today uh, and all you need to do is just click join the program to be able to move between those different sessions as the day continues uh, if you are having any difficulties, please write in the chat what exactly is going on and we will do the best we possibly can to try to assist you. I will say though that we are not necessarily tech experts, um, so please bear with us as we try to sort out whatever issue you might be having. Uh, if you would like to ask questions of our panelists today, please be sure to use the Q&A function. That is the two speech bubbles. All you need to do is just type it in there and we'll make sure it gets to them. Uh, feel free to use the chat to ask questions of each other and to kind of debate on the merit or the different things that are being brought up uh, in our presentation. Or if you have uh, a request for more information, we'll be sure to put as many resources as we can down into that chat today. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you will continue to be engaged with the museum. And it gives me absolute great pleasure to introduce uh, CMH Board of Directors member Hugh Dusick and uh, president of the Mapping Congress, who is going to be your host for today's program. Well, hello everybody. It's uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we've got an exciting day of investigating old maps. Um, if you don't know already, the Historic Mapping Congress has been going for several years and we investigate maps and use technology to look in and find out what we can about what the landscape was back in the revolutionary era. And we're focusing particularly on Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, and also on Orangeburg in South Carolina, the, the, the revolutionary backcountry, which played such an important role in the later stages of the American War. So we've got several interesting talks today, and let me introduce uh, everybody who's going to be here uh, giving their talk today. First of all, we have uh, Jim Williams. Uh, Jim Williams is a uh, local historian and the uh, treasurer and what's called the corresponding secretary of the Mecklenburg Historical Association. Um, he's been involved with computers in the past and has written several books and is well known as a reenactor. Um, so uh, Jim will be our first uh, speaker. Then uh, David McCorkle, who's actually from here in Charlotte. He has a, uh, a, something, a long history. His family has been here a long time. Uh, David is a genealogical researcher, uh, particularly with uh, North Carolina land records. And uh, he is also the president of the uh, Durham Orange Genealogical Society. Uh, I'll be giving the next talk after that. And uh, I'm uh, on the board of the Charlotte Museum here. And I'm also a professor at Central Piedmont. And then uh, the last talk this morning will be by Dr. Steve Katzberg, uh, who's from Orangeburg, South Carolina, uh, who was a professor, I think, uh, in years gone by. Uh, at South Carolina State University and has been involved with projects involving NASA and he will be talking about um, uh, maps as well. So um, now I've, that was my introduction and now I'm going to hand it over to Jim. Thank you, Hugh. Um, let me get started here. Um, this is a short talk about the uh, road development in the backcountry uh, with a special emphasis on the heads of navigation which is something we have not discussed much. Um, first of all, I'd like to review some of the things that we've done the last two years in talking about the development of roads in this area. <clears throat> and the basic point is that roads run from Ford to Ford. 
in our case from the Trading Ford to the Nation's Ford, which was originally a Buffalo Trail uh, with, uh, I'm seeing something, okay. Uh, a Buffalo Trail and another game because these migrating animals needed to cross the rivers at a convenient ford. And these are the fords they chose. And, and the buffalo, of course, made a wide path connecting those. When the Woodland Indians came into this area, uh, they followed those same paths because for the same reason, they needed to have a way to cross the, uh, to cross the rivers. Uh, the trading ford on the Yadkin is the first place you can cross that river uh, coming upstream from, uh, from the ocean. Uh, it's the first, first ford you can use. Uh, the uh, Catawba River has quite a number of fords that can be used, but the nation's ford was the one that went to, which is where the, uh, uh, Indi the uh, Indian nation, um, the Catawba Indian nation, established themselves. Um, then there's, there's a very brief time when the Spaniards used that same road uh, on their way back uh, down uh, to the east. And then finally the Europeans came in and of course they had to cross the Yadkin at the trading ford and they followed that, that uh, trail down that the buffalo had which is the road we know today as the Salisbury Road or Tryon Street. Uh, another way to look at that is the historic development of these roads. First, you had game trails, and, and uh, those were followed by the Indians. Then you had wagon roads, which went at lots of different places, but one of the major ones was from uh, uh, the Trading Ford to the Nation's Ford, and those were mud roads, dirt roads and uh, they were dirt right up until uh, the, the, uh, up till about 1900 <laughs> and more. Um, Mr. McAdam developed his gravel road in 1830, but it was not widely used until really the invention of the motor car. Next, uh, however, come the railroads, and we got our railroad in 1852, they followed those same paths because a, uh, although they were bridging the uh, rivers, but a, a ford was a good place to build a bridge. Um, then of course the roads got paved and we instituted uh, national and uh, state highways and they went lots of places, but the, um, uh, the, the, the one exception to all of this is interstate highways because they were uh, instituted by uh, President Eisenhower in order to provide a way to carry military supplies across the country. And they went from major city to major city and didn't pay much attention to forts. And I'll talk in a minute about the heads of navigation. Now, here is a map of the um, uh, the, the major road in Mecklenburg County. You see the Trading Ford, you see the Nation's Ford Road. Uh, shortly, uh, just south of the Nation's Ford is Salisbury. Uh, it was a major town early on. The district court was held there. And um, the, um, um, uh, and this is where the Indian villages were just south of the Trading Ford early on. In Charlotte, there's another another road that goes off to the Takasiji Ford, and that was the road that went to the Cherokee. And in uh, Western North Carolina, in the Cherokee area, there is a Takasiji River and a Takasiji town. Um, so that, the, that, and this is the price Strother map, 1808. And these roads are clearly seen on this map, and I've highlighted them here for us. The, to talk about the heads of navigation. Uh, the head of navigation is a place where if you start out in salt water and go up a river or creek, eventually you get to a place where you can't go any further. That's the head of navigation. It's often a falls or a, a ford or even a rapid. Uh, and uh, of course, every stream has one 
And this is, this is a very important place because if you are bringing materials, uh, goods upstream, you have to stop there and transfer them to another mode of transportation, perhaps a, a, a boat above the river, above the falls, but uh, more likely to a wagon, horse and wagon. In this particular case, we're looking at the Muzon 1775 map, which was the one that was used by both sides during the revolution, um, especially in the south. And um, uh, the, the road we're talking about is the road to, uh, to the head of navigation at the Catawba Water Re River, which is Camden. It starts uh, up north just north of Charlotte, Charlottesburg, as he said, <clears throat> uh, about where um, W.T. Harris is today. This road is easily traced on the, uh, the uh, Muzon map. Uh, it goes down to Camden and it stops because south of there, there is water transportation and there's also the watery swamp, which is apparently a, a huge and uh, difficult to navigate swamp. The second example, is the Yadkin PD River. That is the Yadkin River in the north and it becomes the PD River uh, as you get into South Carolina. Uh, this road goes from the same place north of Charlotte on the, the, uh, the um, uh, main road. Uh, it's easily traced on the map. I've highlighted it here. It goes down to Ch Chiraw and Chiraw is an interesting uh, uh, village because it comes and goes from various maps. A number of a map, mom, number of the early maps don't show Shiraw. This uh, McMer McRae Brazier of 1833 does show that one. And this road goes directly from Charlotte to Shiraw without going, going out of its way to go through any towns. The only major town that I found there is Wadesboro and it doesn't go near there. It just goes straight on down. The idea was to get to the head of navigation as quickly and, and expeditiously as possible. The third one in this area <clears throat> is the rook map to the head of navigation, the Cape Fear River. Uh, that is Cross Creek or now Fayetteville. Uh, and uh, it, it comes from the uh, uh, Moravian settlements, Salem, Bethabara, Bethania and it's called the Cape Fear Road. And this makes it unique. This is called it 1770, very early, but he put names of roads on his map. <clears throat> and the Cape Fear Road name shows up on this map uh, three or four times. And that's why we know that it split. Both of them are la labeled Cape Fear Road. It split and rejoined uh, coming from the Moravian settlements back on down to to Cross Creek. Well, that talks about the heads of navigation in this particular part of the country. There are a couple other things to talk about. <clears throat> One is when you look at this, these heads of navigation, you find there's a number of state capitals that are uh, located there. Augusta, Georgia is the head of navigation of the Savannah River, and it was a state capital but for only 10 years. 17, after the revolution, 1786 to 96. Columbia, South Carolina is the head of navigation on the Congaree River. Richmond, Virginia is the head of navigation on the Potomac. Uh, Trenton, New Jersey is the head of navigate at, at navigation of the Delaware River. The one we're missing here is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, North Carolina and Raleigh is not on the head of net on the creek that's head of navigation, but it's pretty close. And finally, people look at these uh, points that are the head of navigation and they talk about a fall line and you can draw that line on a map. It doesn't exist any place on a map. It's an imaginary line, if you will, but it does show you where the, the falls lie because often the, um, uh, when, you, when you go past the falls, you're, you've passed an escarpment, which uh, a chain, is a change in the geology uh, marked by these falls. And so you see that with Macon, Augusta, Columbia, 
Raleigh is not on on the, the fall line, but close by, uh, Petersburg and Richmond and so on, uh, uh, and it goes all the way to, to New England. So that's the end of this presentation. All right, Jim, that's great. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so very interesting about the uh, heads of navigation and uh, where the towns are located. Well, uh, we're moving right along here. So our next, next up will be David. David McCorkle is going to give a presentation and this one is on uh, creating historical overlay maps. All right. My um, presentation is called uh, Historical Overlay Maps, and uh, um, David McCorkle is he introduced. Um, as Jim just went through, there's tons of information on these old maps that we can use for both genealogy, history, etc. And it's useful to locate that information on a modern map. Uh, you know, you can look at an old map, but where is that today? Is there anything left of it? Whatever we're looking for. And to do that, we use common points, both natural and man-made, creeks, rivers, uh, buildings that may still exist, etc. However, as we know, things have changed. Rivers get dammed up. There's a lot of stuff under Lake Norman now that used to be historical, uh, historical, uh, historical value. Uh, roads get abandoned and plowed over, so you can't even tell where they were anymore. Creeks get rerouted. Uh, try finding Sugar Creek through Charlotte. I mean, it goes all over the place now. And one way to help with that is what are called overlay maps. So what you can do is um, you can use georeference, which I think Steve's gonna go into detail uh, in the next lecture, where you basically have your digital image of a map and you add information to it, basically location, where it is on earth, you know, scale, how big it is, you know, how many uh, inches per mile, all that kind of stuff, orientation to north, south. And when I do that with multiple maps, there's software that can adjust them since that knows the common information, like how big they are and all that. So they actually match each other exactly. And there's tons of software to do that. I'm gonna go over some really easy to use ones for you as a demo shortly. Um, once you overlay these, you can do transparency. So, you know, if you think about it, if you put paper on top of each other, it's no good, but you could actually make it so you can see through and help locate these common points of interest. And typically you have what's called the base map, which is your modern map. You lay it on top of a street map or a satellite image or whatever. So for the first example, this is a map of uh, Charlotte from 1877. It was actually the original, this isn't the original, the original is at New York Public Library. You can see it online, but this says traced in 1911. I'm not sure what the deal was there, but basically it's, it's uh, based on a map that shows Charlotte in 1877. Um, we can see some things like uh, the old cemetery, that's Sutler Cemetery, you know, Trade and Tryon, that's been there forever and so forth. So what I'm gonna do is hotkey over to this website. This is North Carolina Digital Maps. There are tons and tons of uh, websites where you can look for maps. This is just one of them. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if you click browse, browse by location, then I can just pick Mecklenburg County. And up pops all the different maps that they've digitized um, for Mecklenburg County. This is a project done by UNC Chapel Hill and the State Archives of North Carolina. Um, and that map I just showed you is in here. But what I'm going to do is click to this interactive tab right here. And what they've done is they've taken a handful of the maps in their collections and did this geo-referencing for them. So then they, they uh, can overlay them on a modern map. So here's the map we just talked about, Map of Charlotte, 1877. So I just click on that and up it comes. Now they've got some little quirk right now. You'll get a little error message and I've sent them an email and they say they're looking into it. And so you'll see this for development purposes only. Just ignore that. But you see, as soon as I zoom in, there's the map right there. And remember I talked about orientation. You can see how it's tilted um, to match North and South. So now we've overlaid this map of uh, old map of Charlotte onto a modern map. I can click fade historic map make it big, and I can sort of see through it, but this is just sort of a starting point. What they've done, you know, this was a one-time project, so they really haven't done anything else to it. They gave you this neat little tool here, open in Google Earth. So they've taken all this geo-referencing information, and I can transfer it to a program called Google Earth, which is a free program, and it does this little dramatic uh, intro here, <laughs> and there's the map. Now, what's different now is, see how it's overlaid directly on top of the modern map. 
but I can click here and here and poof, there's the modern map right there. So you see how I can layer, make different levels of transparency so you can see right through it. So just an example, let's zoom in here. Hopefully you don't get too dizzy with me moving my cursor around. You can see this is a spectrum center. You see the railroad tracks here. So as I zoom out, same old railroad tracks. So those tracks have been there for quite a while. And then I can also see that Mrs. R. Holton right here, uh, she was right at the Spectrum Center and little did she know that 150 years from uh, when she had this property that all these real tall guys would be running up and down and throwing balls and baskets and making millions of dollars to do it. So uh, it kind of makes you wonder what your property is gonna be doing in the next uh, 150 years. Um, and zoom out, we saw the uh, Sutler Cemetery right here. And again, I can bring in the old map, the current map. And you can see the Sutler Cemetery, cemetery is still there. Here's Presbyterian Church. And if I was, go back to the old map, it was obviously a lot smaller back then. They've expanded. But you get the point that using this technique, you can find things on modern maps and know where to look for them, um, especially if you're out in a rural area, finding cemeteries and things like that. Um, is also a very useful thing to do. Let's switch back to, uh, oh, let me show you one. I hate to wait just a second, but they've got this other option that's pretty wild. You can click this and you get this 3D building thing. So now you can see sort of this strange, uh, different kind of view. It's kind of interesting to look at, but we'll leave it at that. So again, this is stuff you can just play with for free. Okay, so let's look at a different map. This is a map of Monroe. Um, if you're not familiar, it's just over to the east of Charlotte in Union County. And you can see the difference here. This is, you know, around the same time period, about 10 years from the other map, except it's hand drawn. Um, so you expect that it's not going to be quite to scale. There's going to be some issues with it. And there are ways of actually taking maps that are not perfect, if you will, and overlaying them into other maps. And I'm going to show you one tool to do that. And it's called GeoReferencer. Basically, you upload your map. So here we have the downtown Monroe map that I've already uploaded. And this is a free, a free website. Um, I click this button that says Geo Reference. Now what it does, it shows my map on the right and the entire world on the left because it has no idea where my map is. And what it wants me to do is find a point on my map and then try to find it on the real map. Now I know enough about Monroe to know that um, uh, Jefferson Street is still there and Haines Street is still there, called the same thing. I assume they haven't changed in that time. So I just put a click here. Now I have to go to the modern map. And again, hope I'm not making you too dizzy here. Here's Monroe. So I want to find Hain and Jefferson. Okay, 207, that's Hain. Trust me on that. And here's Jefferson. So boom. So now I've said this point here is the same on the right as it is on the left. Now that gets it located in space, you know, where it is on the earth, but it gives me no idea of scale, how big the map is, how it's oriented. So I need more points. So um, here's Windsor Street down here. You can see Windsor Street. And so let's do Hain and Windsor. Click. And here is Windsor right here, Hain and Windsor. Click. So now I've got two points and that's enough to at least get started. So now I can click this button here that says overlay. Oh, it wants more points. Okay, well that's fine. Oh wait, something's a little funny looking here. Did I do this right? Okay, so let's give it some more points. So here's um, Church Street right here, Church and Jefferson, click. And let's zoom in. Church and Jefferson. And notice it tilted a little bit when I did that. And now let's do Church and Windsor. Click. It's always brave doing live demos. Um, yeah, things can go wrong, so bear with me if they do. Okay, now let's try overlay. Much better. So now you see it's overlaid this map, and it's pretty decent. Um, there's a uh, little slider here. You see it up in the upper corner, so I can again fade it in and out. And you can see how the, the streets are matching pretty decently. Even though this was a crudely hand-drawn map, I've got it matching pretty good. I can see things like Presbyterian Church. Um, if I look in the middle of the map here, just to show you, this is a 
some strange artifact. It looks kind of like a gallows. I don't know what it is. One way to find out to help you is notice you can change what I call the base map. It's got different ones you can pick and I can actually pick the satellite map. So when I pick the satellite map and fade it back in, how about that? It's the old Monroe courthouse. So that's actually the scales of justice we're looking at. Now that's the later courthouse, the original one um, that was replaced. But uh, you know, if I didn't know that was a courthouse there, that satellite image is gonna really help me, okay? So let's switch over back to my PowerPoint and we'll do one more example. This is a map uh, that was originally done, <coughs> excuse me, in 1789 by Joseph Graham. And it has a lot of um, information related to the Revolutionary War, which pretty much just concluded. Uh, this, this is a copy again of the original map, the original maps at the State Archives, and it's really hard to read. It's kind of almost in pencil. I, had, I was gonna show you some slides of it, but since I only have 12 minutes, I'll skip that part. Um, let's kind of zoom in here on this map. And you can see, um, you know, there's Charlotte in the center. That's uh, Trade and Tryon right there. We can see various landmarks. Um, you know, he was a military guy, so he's got information like you can see Cornwallis's route, if you see right there. So a lot of stuff that's real applicable to the type of research that the uh, Congress does. So the one thing you might notice if you're familiar with maps, this one's really, uh, things are sort of in the same relative position, but you really can't you know, use this for, you know, you can use it for basic navigation, but it's not as accurate as you would hope to try to find these things. These curves in the rivers are just not you know, gonna exactly match the rivers, but we can still, with this georeferencing tool, be able to take this map and uh, do it. So let's click back over to uh, georeferencer. Oops. And here you see I've got this map. This was a scan. They have the original in the Carolina room at the Charlotte Library, and so they were able to scan it for me. And that's something, if they have uh, maps that are in the public domain, you can ask them to scan them uh, for you. Now, in this case, I'm not gonna go through all the dots because I did a lot of dots, but you can see where I've got all the different blue dots here. So let's do overlay and zoom in. You see this is covering a way larger area than the, uh, than the previous map, but notice how because of my dots, it's distorted the map a little bit to try to make it fit. So the more dots I put in, the more accurate it's going to be. All right, let's zoom in a little bit and see some of the sites. For example, um, again, I picked Trade and Try on the square right here. Uh, Sugar Creek Church, that's still there, so that was a good one. How about this, H. Alexander. So if we were doing this in person at the Charlotte Museum of History, this would be you are here, Hezekiah Alexander House, right? So I was able to do that. You can see Steel Creek Church. Uh, I picked some places like where creeks come into, you know, Sugar Creek hits the Catawba River some places where the rivers uh, cross the county line. Now you can see the distortion right here because on the original map, this North Carolina, South Carolina border is just a straight line, right? But when I put where these creeks cross, it adjusted it so it tries to make it slightly more accurate, okay? So um, for this particular map, I will point out one thing of interest. Um, as Hugh mentioned, my family's from here. This is Esquire McCorkle. This is actually my fifth great grandfather. I was real excited when I found out he was marked on this map because uh, there aren't that many names on it. So uh, that's, that's an honor, I guess. He wasn't that famous or anything, but uh, I guess maybe, maybe he gave some dinner to Joseph Graham and he put his name on the map or something. Now, when we fade back to the street map, you can see it's right around here, Wesley Chapel. Um, that's in Union County. It used to be Mecklenburg, now it's Union. And I happen to know from land grants and other research that his uh, property was actually right about here. So only about a couple of miles away. So, you know, for our, for, if you're really into accuracy, that's pretty far away. But if you consider the size of this map to be able to find out where he lived, you know, within two miles is actually pretty good. And, you know, be, being able to do this georeferencing to make that happen. Um, and that, ooh, I think I'm right about 12, right here. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to yeah. um, ask them, answer them. Count 12? Yes. Hello? Okay. There you are. 
Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, we are about 12, but uh, anybody, if, put, uh, if you have a question, please put them in the chat and that would be great. And uh, I think we'll address questions at the end. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, Unless there's something of burning interest. <laughs> there is one other thing I could show in about two minutes, but I'll leave it up to you on whether you can, I can do that or not. Uh, I think, go, go ahead, David. We got a couple of minutes. We're, we're good. Okay. Um, one other thing that's of interest is um, boundaries, Geogra uh, you know, government boundaries like county lines. If you're not familiar with how counties formed in North Carolina, it started out with just one territory and it finally kept splitting and splitting and splitting. And if you're doing research and you see something about roads or whatever that are going through certain counties, you need to know where that county was. And there's a really uh, easy tool to go to called the um, Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. So I can click on this, click on North Carolina, and I do this view interactive map. <laughs> I clicked on Virginia, excuse me. <laughs> click on North Carolina, view interactive map. And you see, starting in 1665, we just had the Albemarle District. So I'm going to go up to 1761, OK? Make it big. And we can see where Charlotte is right here. But note, when I look, this was Anson County. So Charlotte actually, at that time, was Anson County. So if I was doing research in this area, I would not look for Mecklenburg County because it didn't exist. And see, this, this tool gives you the exact borders overlaid onto a current map. So this is a case of not overlaying a whole map on something, but overlaying boundaries onto a modern map, okay? Um, and if you said this road goes through Anson County, you've got a lot of territory to cover here. Let's just go to 63 and notice what happened. Aha, Mecklenburg County got formed. And so now I can look and see that we have Mecklenburg County. And what if I was interested in where that boundary is I can just zoom in and like I said, it's looking at a current map so I can see exactly where the old boundary between Mecklenburg and Anson County was. And if you're on 74 heading like towards Wilmington, you notice after you pass Monroe, there's a huge curve in the road. And if you go this way, you can go down to Myrtle Beach. That's where the old boundary was. So next time you do that, you can say, wow, this was the boundary between Mecklenburg and Anson before there was Union County. So that's all I had to say. I just wanted to show that tool real quick. Um, and again, you can see you can pick any date you want and it will show what North Carolina looked like up until the last county was formed. And um, well, actually there were some changes, but uh, in the twenties and so forth. All right, that's all I have to say. All right, that's great, David. Thanks. That's so interesting, isn't it? About the, uh, about the uh, overlaying the maps. And, and it's also interesting that your ancestor is right there on that, on that uh, early map. That's amazing. All right, well, I'm gonna be up next. So uh, let's go and share my screen, which is, uh, we're gonna do that. And uh, I'm gonna give a short talk on uh, the roads of Mecklenburg County. Some of the things we're thinking about um, with the Congress over the, over the years. And this will sort of lead into Steve's talk, which is coming up next. So here we are. Um, uh, there, here is the Muzon map with Charlottesburg at the center of it right here. Uh, here we are, Charlottesburg. And um, well, the, you can, uh, the, the Muzon map doesn't show many roads. It shows a few things uh, on the Muzon map from 1775, but there, is really, there are questions about the Muzon map, which we're going to get to in a minute. Uh, I put in here uh, that the red dots are from our seven sisters, the Presbyterian churches, the original uh, settlement pattern of Mecklenburg County, which because there wasn't a Charlotte right at the beginning, there was just people moving in here, Scots, Irish and Germans settling in this area, particularly Scots, Irish in this area. And so these were some of the original points. Um, settlement points, important points that people were thinking about. So the roads, the road system that developed uh, would be uh, connecting these places together as people moved around. And by the way, as you can see, this list of seven sisters, these, uh, it, there's actually eight on this list because the, uh, the lists don't all agree but, uh, about which should be in the seven sisters. But here we are. Uh, next we have the, um, oops, 
Next we have, so Providence Road, which you might know well, uh, and we had a, quite a discussion about that last time about, well, we know where Providence Road is, but we're not quite sure how it sort of goes into Charlotte. Um, but this was the road, Providence Road, to the Providence Church, which was in the south of Charlotte. And so what are some, what about some of these names? Sardis Road, now that's later than the revolutionary era, but it goes down to the, it's in the southeast of Charlotte, but again, it goes to the Sardis Church. There's a whole area then and that follows on that people start to call other roads Sardis Road North, and there's a whole lot of connections to the name Sardis. Okay, and then we have other names um, going to places uh, which we just talked about, Monroe, and I'm never quite sure how to, is it Monroe or Monroe, but um, Monroe Road goes to Monroe, and Albemarle goes to Albemarle, named after the Duke of Albemarle. And then you have other mystery ones, such as Lawyer's Road, and I don't think we've ever quite got to the bottom of why it's called Lawyer's Road. Uh, you know, you tend to think, well, there's lots of lawyers on there, but that may not be the case at all. And it may be derived from somebody's name, somebody who lived along the road who, who had a similar name, uh, but it turned into Lawyer's Road. If anybody knows, anybody has any suggestions, let us know. Uh, Remount Road is much later, but uh, that's over in West Charlotte. It's not revolutionary era, but uh, an unusual name. And it's connected to the, uh, this is a monument for a Camp Green, because that was during the 20th century. But that was also where, where people remounted their horses when they were training at the military camp near Charlotte. Uh, fords were also important, where you could cross the Catawba River. Of course, the Catawba River is uh, uh, being dammed and changed, but uh, when it was just the river, then these were important points because now we just zip over on bridges, but uh, back then you had to um, take a fort, cross over on a ford or, or use a ferry to cross over the Catawba. So these were also important that uh, we need to be uh, thinking about. And that's Lands Ford. Uh, not many of these Fords are still there, but this one is uh, that in South Carolina, Lands Ford. The nation's Ford Road, and uh, I often talk about this with my students. So that was the, the road that went down to the nation. Here's the Catawba down here to the south, the Catawba Nation. And this is where the, uh, uh, the, the old road, which is, I think has changed several times. And, uh, but this is named for the road that went from Charlotte down to the nation, down to the Catawba, which must have been important, uh, certainly at the beginning of the settlement in this area. Now, one of my sort of interests, I guess you could say, is everywhere you see in Charlotte, uh, when you hear, look at new information about the history of Charlotte, talks about well Charlotte's at a, a crossroads it's the crossroads of trade and triumph of course that's why Charlotte should be there because they were the crossroads and um, and that makes sort of makes absolute sense yes of course well uh, when you look at the moves on that um, oh by the way yeah Tryon Street named after the British governor William Tryon who um, came here in 1768 and met with the settlers here and they named the street after him but when you look at the Mouzon map, and you look at the Mouzon map, and I just indicated, here's Charlotte, Charlottesburg, and that thing crossing it is not a street. That's a, that's a branch of Sugar Creek, uh, that's Steel Creek, there it is. And it's not, um, that's not, so where's the crossroads on the Mouzon map? Now, as others in our Congress point out, you know, you can't really trust these maps and that that's really true because they're not 100%, you know, they're not as good as Google Earth today. So where is this crossroads? Was there a crossroads or is this just an that kind of people are just making up or um, a legend? Well, um, actually, if you look at some other maps later on, this one is the... Uh, uh, a Faden Cornwallis map from 1787. And um, there you can see, yes, there is a crossroads. You can see how it's going out to Takasiji Ford 
going out towards the west. Yes, that does have a crossroads. And then I did find, you don't have to read all of this, but this is from the original deed for Charlotte, um, setting up the 360 acres, you know, going on about the white oak from Thomas Polk's line, da 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 da, black oak sapling, and which is the way they uh, mark these things. And they, but look, yes, look, thence to the beginning, including the crossroads and containing by survey 360 acres of land. So there was a crossroads back in 1767. Uh, it, it's, it's, the, the Musel map is, is incorrect. And that's one of, the, one of the activities of the Congress we're trying to do is to understand and to investigate such matters when we find issues with maps that are not correct. Uh, this is uh, a, a great topic which we looked at before as well about Potter Road. I once went on a, on a drive through the countryside with Jim Williams. Uh, we were on the way to a historic mapping Congress meeting and, and the GPS sent us all over the place and we often encountered Potter Road along the way. It's like, there's a, it, what is this Potter Road? Well, this little corner here, which is in Charlotte, is Kilbourne and Central. And when I first came to Charlotte many years ago, I thought that looks odd. And actually this bit over here on the left is the remains of Potter Road, or one of the a sort of, they're just little smidgens of Potter Road left. If you go in the woods behind near Sheffield Park, you can find the remains of a road through there too, which appears to be connected to this as well. So there are all these stories that came up uh, about, well, maybe it's named for some British general who forged his way through here, General Potter. Well, no, it's, no, it's not, you know, this is not true. Um, what about pots? Maybe it's a road to Charleston for the pottery industry. That was important. Well, no, uh, as it turns out, and thanks to the research of, and the experts on this at Jim Williams and Larry Barden, uh, the court records show that there was a road and it was Gordon Potter's Road. And so it is, that is probably the origin of all of these, these names of Potter Road. And I marked in on this green line here, roughly where the Potter Road went. It sort of bypassed uh, Charlotte. Uh, so other interesting topics, just to finish up here. One is uh, Alexanderana Road, which in 2015 changed its name uh, you can actually make this happen, and that uh, because it's it's changed in to Alexandriana, because that's the name of the uh, house where uh, Hezekiah Alexander's brother lived, Alexandria. It's in in Huntersville, in the, to the north of Charlotte. Uh, so we we did actually manage to get that to change, but not so with uh, I well I don't think we haven't really tried to do this. Uh, I work at Central Piedmont and near the, uh, the central campus, near one of the buildings I often met in, uh, I would see the sign Charlottetown Avenue. It's an old part of Independence Boulevard renamed as Charlottetown Avenue. And I couldn't find anywhere in the colonial archives. And I searched and searched and uh, where, where we spell it Charlottetown with an E. What's with this Charlottetown with an E? Yes. Charleston, South Carolina, yes, but not Charlottetown with an E. And I wrote to the Department of Transport about it, of course, and uh, they say, well, we think it's named after the mall. But, and there is a mall. There was a, a mall nearby, the Charlottetown Mall, but it didn't have an E in the spelling. So anyway, yeah, I, I can do a bit of photoshopping there. We can, we can change it, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's worth really making a big fuss about it. But there we are. So um, what we're doing then with the Historic Mapping Congress, you know, we're looking into researching and, and looking to the landscape. When I grew up, you know, I'd look around where I lived in Southeast London and, and think, well, behind all these houses and tree and cars and buildings and people living in the, in the modern world, there's this other landscape of the world from before. And that's what we're trying to create here, under, understanding and seeing the landscape of what people were doing back in the revolutionary era, all the different items in their worldview, what would they have? Today we travel around Charlotte and we know where we're going and what we're doing. And uh, well, what were th people thinking of about this in the revolutionary era? 
and addressing issues such as these points we've brought up here people didn't have a People didn't go on the Great Wagon Road much you know, like today we go on the I-85 or something. The Great Wagon Road is a later name that people gave to what people might have called the road to the north or the road to Salisbury. Um, so we're trying to understand more and understand more about these matters to do with roads and sites. And yeah, what's the origin of some of these names? And finishing collecting up all as much information and links as possible because people have done a lot of great research about these things and we want to collect this information or or make it available so that um, all of us through the wonders of technology and the internet can do research ourselves and we can expand a whole lot of information and knowledge about this world the world of a revolutionary era so that's my talk and uh, i'm going to leave it off here and I'm uh, going to go now to Steve and hand it over to Steve. Okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about real quickly uh, this morning, uh, which we can discuss in more detail in the afternoon, is trying to build a colonial georeference canvas uh, related to the, the Charlottetown Sester Centennial. Um, it, there's a, a, a meeting resource you can go to www.charlottetownroads.net and there will be uh, some of the maps that you can actually look at yourself that have been georeferenced as well as a couple links at the top of the page to, um, to see some uh, uh, zoomed in areas that we can talk about in the afternoon. Well, why a colonial map canvas? Well, basically historical record is mostly correspondence, records, plats, reports, et cetera, which give you individual events, snapshots, but without context. The maps give a context for places and movement, how one event relates to another. Dynamics, in another word, can be viewed in a new context for critical analysis. You might have one report from one platform one document or report from another and, and actions around a battle or, or some action or troops moving one place to the other that seem to be inconsistent. And you can then try to resolve the inconsistencies by another dimension, in this case, maps. So in, in addition to that, taken together, if you have the events and the, the map context, it helps to bring history more to life. It adds a second dimension. It may not be three, three dimensions, but you go from the one dimension of snapshots to adding dynamics and you get a two-dimensional view of what went on. As was mentioned a bit earlier, turning back the hands of time, uh, you've got to undo what's happened in the modern world that uh, interferes with why the modern world is not uh, is not consistent with what the past was. You have development, of expansion, urban ex expansion, war, urban renewal, calamities, floods, whatever. They serve to obliterate the outward vestiges of the past. And worse, some of the roads have been moved, as we've noted before, as Hugh noted in. Um, Ms. McCorkle noted earlier, the road names have been changed and not the same as they were. Rivers have been dammed. There's, uh, uh, the, the, the Catawba is, is bigger than it used to be. And uh, so what we do is we start our search by looking for old maps. The problem with old maps, which we've seen with Muzon and with De Brom, which was earlier than Muzon and then Cook, is that, um, the maps are all virt uh, virtually all derive one from the previous with some additions plus propagated errors. There's the apocryphal Pelham County of North Carolina, which existed on maps from the early 1700s all the way nearly to 1800, a county that, that didn't even exist. And it was just an advertisement thing to get Lord Pelham to pay for having done the map, which he didn't do. So finally, that was uh, removed. You can also see on some of the stuff that Hugh is showing, uh, roads uh, from uh, Cook or Muzon.
um, never existed. So even agreed to Prime Meridian. They were Prime Meridian has been Greenwich and, and near London. It's been London. It's been Washington D.C. Uh, New York, Canary Islands, Philadelphia, Paris, Berlin, none. But in the latter part of the 1700s, which is to say past De Brom, Cook, and Muzon, or around the time of that Muzon, the actual science of geographically accurate mapping, coupled with the exploration, developed rapidly. Um, the early maps, how do you make a map? Well, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? We know uh, to determine where you are that in the, uh, the north, in latitude is fairly easy. You measure how far the sun is at, at noon from the horizon and uh, looking due south. Um, and, and, but getting uh, longitude, the other dimension that you need, sort of an X and Y, you can get the, the Y, but you don't know what the X is. We know that in the 1500s, longitude could be no, known to tens of degrees by a method called lunar distances, where you look at actually where the moon is in its, in its, um, in its relationship to the star background. And by knowing that information, you know when with a table from some other place, you can estimate how many hours you are shifted and, and hence degrees from the, the, your reference source. Galileo's method was developed later in 1600s that are based on the periods of the moons of Jupiter, which if you could sit at some place long enough and watch these periods and from a table, you could find out basically celestial time and hence get your location. By the mid 1700s, accuracies in general application were still on the order of degree Degree of a degree, and so if you look down at the bottom, one degree at the equator is about 60 nautical miles. By 1800, the time for some of the maps we're looking at here, and way past the Muzon, Cook, and De Brom maps, as well as McFad uh, the Fadden maps, which were taken from Cook and, and Muzon, that had uh, Cornwallis's uh, marches on them, accuracy had improved to about uh, a nautical mile, but we're still talking about a nautical mile, big distance on and trying to identify roads and stuff in local areas. The three candidate maps we've been looking at, or I've been looking at, are the John Graham, which was actually a map-like plat. We can talk about that later, about why map, uh, plats are usually worthless, but the John Graham plat of Mecklenburg County is actually something that is in between a map and a plat. Uh, there's a redrawn version of the Graham map in 1790. And then, of course, there's the Brown and Stone, North Carolina map of 1808. And of course, that's in the same link, which has been identified already about where you can find these and where I got these. So how do you connect an old map to the world of modern geographical data? And that's that's by done by georeferencing. And what that means is you take Im immutable, or what you hope to be immutable, accurately located features uh, such as creeks, rivers, known physical locations, lakes, topography, and a modern coordinate system. And that can be done by standard modern uh, chronometers and, and um, um, even lunar distances, if you want to do it that way, or Galileo's method, or GPS. But what these features, if you if once you know what they are, you can identify them as consistently consistently on a map, the, the unknown map that you're I mean the map that you know which you would like to georeference. That and and understanding that the his historical map was on paper or some other medium and it could have stretched or otherwise been physically changed. Then what you do when you have these locations and you cross reference them from from the modern map to the actual map that you're trying to correct, then you use one of several ma uh, mathematical transformations, uh, Helmert, which is rotations, uh, scaling, and I believe, and lateral translation, or polynomial, where you apply a mathematical formula of one, more, uh, one two, three, four degrees, um, uh, 
powers in the polynomial, you apply those and then you take a look at what you got left, you look at the, the RMS errors from the points you've identified, and you wash, repaint, rinse, repeat, inspect, repeat until satisfied. And sometimes you don't very get very far. This is the John Graham Platt of 1789. Um, which is, it's a plat, but because it has so many features on it, can serve actually as a, as a map that you can actually georeference. Plats are generally worthless for that, but this one is particularly, is particularly useful. This is it, uh, the same plat, which is now, um, um, it has been contrast enhanced, and so that you can see objects on it and be able to identify them better. So once that's once I got that, and that was georeferenced, and this is a blow up of the grand. Uh, variety of sources. About that one later. Um, um, in the afternoon for more time. What you can see though is a georeferencing with, with rivers, creeks, the Catawba River, roads that were, that were or, or modern roads that have been superimposed on a, the georeferenced map. Notice also, no matter what you do, take a look at the bend in the Catawba River in this blue area up here near the Hopewell Presbyterian Church and you can see even with a, a fairly extensive georeferencing of several points on this map, you just can't stretch the map to make it work right because the map wasn't accurately drawn in, in, at the beginning. This one is now the Brown and Stone map of North Carolina in 1808, a, uh, a fully, <clears throat> a, a beautiful map. Uh, South Carolina didn't have a, a surveyed map like this until about 1820 to 22. And the, the Wilson map, also known as the, let's see, um, I forget what the other name, but it's, it's the Wilson surveys. Um, this map here um, uh, has been georeferenced. You can see uh, the, uh, the, the creeks georeferenced on it. You can see the locations and how well it did. You can see that this one matches the uh, Catawba Bend better. There are creeks uh, that are shown, modern creeks and creeks that were drawn that are inconsistent with one another, but that's what you get. You can also see the, cro the central crossroad in Charlotte. I'm going to go a little bit further into zooming into this thing. This one is now zoomed further in, and you can see some of the modern roads that are there. We can identify those roads. There, there's a database that goes with each one. You can see the road numbers. You can see particularly um, what we're looking at there is uh, Tuckasegee Ford um, and the roads that appear to go there. This has been also further georeferenced. Let me see if we can show that on the next one. Um, you can see the roads that are that overlay the location, important locations uh, overlaid with this. These are, are this is a georeferenced map. Is, it laid into a latitude and longitude or universal, I mean, uh, universal transverse Mercator. I can't remember which, which one it is, but you can see that the roads, there's a, there's a whole lot of, of decent matching of the roads. Um, and that are several of the points down here, you can compare with either the creeks or the, 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 um, the annotations on the map to see how well they, how well they line up. Using something like this, you can go into more detail to um, to examine the um, to, to examine the whether those roads map uh, those roads match properly with the features that are on the maps. Uh, you can compare that. You can that you can provide a critique and try to do a better job of georeferencing or use the maps as as they as, as they are. So anyway, using uh, using maps to turn back to the hands of time to the late 1700 Charlottetown can produce a useful and informative tableau. The maps provide a context for historical events and interrelation with other histories. And three map sources have been found in georeference, and they appear to be ready to support the addition of location and the, uh, the, the, the consideration of the, the context for the period events. And that's all I've got to say. 
All right, yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Steve. And we're going to be hearing more from Steve later in the, in the afternoon when we meet for uh, uh, one o'clock. And uh, now we've got a couple of, we've actually a bit over time here. But I had a couple of questions, at least one question came up. And if anybody wants to jump in here, uh, David, Jim, anybody, uh, which will be, why did the Catawba become part of South Carolina? You can see on the map that the Catawba Nation is in South Carolina. Um, anybody like to jump in and, and answer that question? From our, we're suddenly a panel. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was just part of when they decided the border between the two Carolinas that was decided that the Catawba Nation would be the border, the upper part. I mean, I don't know if there was any political reason why. Well, actually, um, the Catawba Nation had uh, traditionally dealt with South Carolina because it's down the river. And uh, after the... Um, European settlers had taken enough land from the Catawbas, they decided they needed to have a piece of land to call their own. Uh, and they went to the North and South Carolina assemblies and got this, uh, uh, this piece of land set aside. And it's, um, it's not straight North and South, it's Northeast and Southwest because that was the way, the way the river ran. And then the story is, I haven't seen it uh, uh, spelled out, but the story is that the uh, North and South Carolina asked the Catawbas which state they wanted to be in. <laughs> and the Catawbas said, well, we want to be in South Carolina because we have always uh, 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 done business down there. And then after that, it's not, it, was, it was the colonies, not the states. And then after that, when they drew the, uh, the boundary line, it had to go up and around the Catawba uh, uh, land. That's why you have those, those straight lines on that, on that map. You know, actually, Jim, wasn't it, it was really at that time a separate, it wasn't part of either state, right? It was their own little nation until we stole it from them. <laughs> and, and, and there's another thing about the state lines that I'm still working on. Uh, it, the, the, the line, line from the Catawba Nation West was a good bit higher than uh, it would be justified. And uh, there was a lot of negotiation in that time before, before 72, when that line was drawn about whether it sh where it should be. And as a matter of fact, b before 1770, uh, everyone knew that the line between the state between the colonies went from where it is where where it was in the Waxhaws due west, not without that big jog. So uh, uh, someday I'll get get around to researching that and write a paper on it. All so right. I can point you to the, uh, I can point you to that. Now. I think it's time, everybody. I think we better uh, let yeah. uh, move on because we're going to have another program at twelve fifteen. But you can see how. These uh, topics, get, we get a lot of discussion going and we could spend uh, you know, a lot of, all morning looking at probably that one. Uh, but let's move on and we'd like to thank the Charlotte Museum for our program today. Thank you to all of the um, presenters today. I think it was a very informative meeting and I hope that we'll be able to, uh, I was planning that we were going to make this available, this recording available. So thanks to everybody and uh, uh, the next thing we will be having is at 12.15, uh, which will be the business of the Congress. Then at uh, one o'clock, we'll be look back with Steve uh, and looking at the Mecklenburg map. So thank you very much, everybody. And I think it's, uh, we'll close the meeting off here. If you have any questions, just, uh, well, send it to us and uh, we'll, uh, we'll come up with some good answers. Thank you. <laughs>